Good evening, everyone. My name is Nicole, and I am the parent support worker for the Niagara Catholic District School Board Early On Child and Family Centers. I am here today for our weekly coffee and conversation in which all parents, grandparents, guardians, and caregivers are welcome. Our program topics revolve around ensuring you feel well, confident, and present in your parenting and caregiving role. As always, if you are unable to sit with me now, you are welcome to warm up your coffee and sit with me at a later, more convenient time. Our video content is available on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel, so be sure to follow and subscribe to stay up to date with our videos. As promised, this week we start our journey in talking about and learning about stress. Today we will focus largely on what stress is and adapt the Kids Have Stress 2 curriculum to focus on your stress as well. So last week in my introduction to the program Kids Have Stress 2, I gave you reasons for why parents benefit from learning about stress. But we didn't talk about why we focus on children's stress. The program tells us that although stress is a normal part of everyday life, you and I certainly know this as adults. It helps motivate us. It adds positive challenge to our life. For instance, that stress we feel before facilitating a work meeting will actually help us perform better. However, too much stress can be counterproductive and overwhelming. This is true for kids too having too much stress. It can make it more difficult for children to concentrate, to learn, and to get along with others. It will also have a profound effect on children's health, or it can have a profound effect on children's health, and it can interfere with children's ability to focus and think. If they are afraid or anxious, children may spend so much energy worrying that they are unable to learn. But what exactly is stress? I'll answer this question with help from the Kids Have Stress 2 program. So there are two, there are, sorry, there are different types of stress that we all experience, both good and bad, and we will all be affected and react differently to our life stressors. Good stress is the optimal amount of stress that helps us feel energized and motivated to do our best work, like the example before in, this, in the stress felt before a presentation. This good stress encourage us to, encourages us to develop coping strategies to deal with these different challenges. When we are able to deal with the stressors and bounce back, we are showing that we are resilient. And resilience is something that we'll focus on in later weeks, and we'll talk about what that is. However, bad stress occurs when our coping mechanisms are overwhelmed by the stress and we become unable to function at our best. So bad stress is usually associated with that feeling of threat, danger, or loss. Despite there being good and bad stress, neither should be avoided. Even the bad stress can be helpful as it, as it motivates us to improve and promote our health as we strive to overcome it. And it's important, too, to be empathetic to various stressors for different people. The same event could stress someone out much more than another, and it's important to understand that. For example, my partner is a very daring and adventurous guy with very few fears, whereas I am afraid of nearly everything. <laughs> he takes me on some really steep, spooky hikes that spike my stress level to the point where my body's reacting in, in ways that I can't control. So I, you know, my knees will start to buckle and I'll start to get sweaty and cold. But it's one of those stressors that I want to overcome because the view and the experience is always so worth it. I just have to remind him sometimes that he has to understand my stress and let me cope in the way that I need to, even if that means moving very, very slowly. <laughs> I'm quoting the Kids Have Stress 2 guide here when I say the ability to cope with and adapt to new and or potentially threatening situations, such as an unfamiliar event or physical danger, is essential to survival. This capacity is built into specific brain circuits whose development is influenced by a range of experiences beginning early in life. The envi environmental stimuli that trigger these circuits are known as stressors and stress reactions. They are the body's chemical and neurological responses that promote adaptation 
stress can become dis distress when we are unable to cope or when we believe we do not have the ability to meet the challenge. Now, I want to talk with you about what really happens on the inside when we feel stress. So the stress response occurs when a person is exposed to a threat or challenge. This causes stress hormones to produce and convert that physical or emotional stress into a chemical signal. So two of the important hormones triggered by the stress response are adrenaline and cortisol. So let's break these down. Adrenaline you've certainly heard of. You'll hear people say, oh my adrenaline is pumping, or I was able to do that because of the adrenaline, you know, when a mother lifts a, a car to save a baby, that's adrenaline that's helping you. Adrenaline is a fast-acting hormone that prepares the body for a quick response. It essentially sends an energy surge throughout our body that strengthens our muscles and increases our heart rate, blood pressure, and oxygen content. Cortisol is like the intense, long version of adrenaline. It too helps with the alertness and is part of that fight or flight response that you may have heard of before. It's our body's preparation to utilize all the tools necessary to handle a situation. However, this cortisol can allow the body to remain alert for minutes, hours, or even days, which can carry the long-term effects of excessive or chronic stress. If you are spending a few days with your cortisol levels elevated, it can lead to exhaustion, a suppressed immune system, increased muscle tension, and reduced concentration concentration. I remember my university professors would always tell me that this is why students get so sick around exam times because they are cramming and stressing for the exams and their immune system actually lowers and they'll be more likely to get sick during those times. So the Kids Have Stress 2 program states and I quote, sustained or frequent activation of the hormonal systems that respond to stress can have serious developmental consequences, some of which may last well past the time of stress exposure. Research shows that long-term elevations in cortisol levels can alter the function of a number of neural systems and may even change the architecture of parts of the brain that are essential for learning and memory. So these hormones are big deals when we talk about stress. But caregivers get to play a critical role in regulating the stress hormone production in the early years of life. Research shows that positive, responsive caregiving can actually decrease the likelihood of problems developing. Children who develop stress management strategies without appropriate adult support often develop strategies that are not adaptive to a more structured group environment. For example, if your child runs away, lashes out, or hides. Um, and they will then need to learn new strategies to replace these ineffective strategies. To summarize, while we all experience positive and negative stress, the physiological response can be used to cope well or cope in maladaptive ways. And when, we, when kids have too much stress, there are consequences for their learning and health. Therefore, understanding stress and supporting your child's use of healthy coping strategies will benefit them greatly. So in future chats, we'll focus more on the developmental uh, aspects of stress and how they influence your approach to reducing that stress in your child. We will also consider stress symptoms and strategies to support them. But for now, I want to shift gears and focus on your stress. Entering the next few weeks will be done best if you first reflect on your own stressors. So for the remainder of this chat, I'm going to use an article by Amber Brown for PositivePsychology.com to review some stress management for us adults. So Brown's seven tips for stress management were adapted from the American Psychology Psychological Association. They are also very similar to the strategies we've talked about for recognizing your child's stressors when we reviewed Dr. Shanker's work. Some concepts may repeat themselves as we go through these topics, but that's okay because we will always build on what we've discussed previously. These stress management tips included, number one, understand your stress. 
Stress is going to look different for everyone. I know that when I'm stressed, I'll start to feel really agitated with people around me and I'll start to sort of get tunnel vision. So if I'm starting to get snappy and lose my ability to multitask, I know I'm probably feeling stressed by something and I need to reflect on how I can support myself. Number two is identify your stress sources. So remember when I told you to consider environmental stressors for your child, like there being too many lights, um, which would cause overstimulation? Well, you have to consider your own stressors too. Obviously, we know the big ones, like discussion of the coronavirus vaccine, could be a stress source for some of us. But what about the less salient stressors that might not be immediately noticeable? Perhaps work deadlines are causing you stress without you even realizing it. Number three, um, becoming aware of your stress signals. So you might speculate that something might cause you stress, but how does your body feel when that stress approaches? Do you start to get tension headaches, a sore neck, stiffness, irritability? Identify these signals so you know when you're starting to become stressed. Number four, recognize your stress strategies. What is it that you do that can calm you down and recenter yourself in times of stress. Notice if it's a positive or a negative behavior. Do you reach for the bag of chips or the bottle of wine? Or do you decide to go outside and have a run? Number five, implement healthy stress management strategies. If you answered yes to the bag of chips or bottle of wine, or perhaps you have another maladaptive coping strategy, Swap out one unhealthy coping strategy at a time. So next time you feel stressed and want to reach for the snack drawer, try calling a friend instead or some other healthy, co healthy coping strategy that might work for you. Try to swap them out one at a time and find what works best for you because it will be different for everyone. Number six, make self-care a priority. This is a big one that I've said time and time again. Just as they tell you on an airplane, put your own oxygen mask on first. We are going to be talking a lot about our kids' stress in the coming weeks, but I want you to really consider your own as well and ensure that you're addressing that stress too. And don't forget, ensuring self-care can be as simple as getting enough sleep or taking that downtime to focus on you. Number seven, ask for support when needed. We are not invincible. As parents, you might feel like you need to hold the world above your head to keep your kids safe, but you don't have to do this alone. When you feel weak and tired, do not be afraid to ask for help. Here's my reminder that we are always available and just a phone call away at the center, but you are also able to call 211 for 24-7 support. I think the takeaway message from these seven tips is to formulate healthy coping strategies. Whether they be action-oriented, which is to change the um, stressful situation through going offline or managing your time, perhaps creating boundaries. There are emotion-oriented um, actions to change the way that we perceive stressful situations. So this could be something like positive affirmations, which we've discussed in the past. Or there are acceptance-oriented actions to deal with stress that we cannot control. So this could be changing your diet, starting to exercise, sleeping more, or meditating. Um, I want you to really think about your own stress and think of at least one positive coping strategy to try this week. So then next week, when we start focusing on your child a bit more, you'll have focused on yourself first. Keep an eye out for some stress management and relaxation techniques from Miss Diane for our mindful mini segment to help you and your child with stress. Next week, we will look at part one of three of developmental considerations when reducing stress. As well, as you would have seen last week, we have our sign up started for the Kids Have Stress 2 workshop. So if you are interested in this, please email me at Nicole. N-I-C-O-L-E dot Mansell, M-A-N-S-E-L-L -L, at N-C-D-S-B dot com if you are interested in joining our free interactive workshop. It will be quite enjoyable. 
I hope you enjoy the rest of your week and we will talk to you soon.